Hello and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network where we dive deep into Wabo's most tattooed work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we are back to talk about Subordination 6.9. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, last last chapter we left off with Blake uh, <laughs> watching TV and, and seeing what bad things were happening. And uh, now he's back in his apartment, the cabal's all there. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're basically doing the same thing. Um, yeah. I like how, you know, he's kind of watching this TV Joel's brought in and it's all like all this bad stuff is happening. And Blake's like, oh, I can see how I just think like, oh, this is just a bad news day or whatever, which is kind mm. of like a bit of a sad statement of affairs. Uh, <laughs> Especially what this was five years ago. So yeah. Yeah. Can only have gotten worse. <laughs> um. I also like this idea, they, they talk about, uh, briefly, uh, so they, they talk about Conquest and, and some stuff related to him, and how if he starts to sort of push things with regards to his promise to keep the city safe uh, to Jeremy, he more than makes up for it just by the power he gains from just causing misery. It's just, just like, yeah. this, this guy's the fucking worst. Like, yeah, that's pretty <laughs> brutal, isn't it? Yeah, I... <laughs> It's it's kind of it's frustrating and it kind of leads into this conversation about being a lord later on in the chapter. But yeah. it does seem like he kind of just has a bit of carte, carte blanche to to fuck fuck shit up and even though he's the lord it doesn't matter too much, which I can see why is a very frustrating thing for Blake to have to experience. Yeah, well these sorts of incarnations and specifically conquest would would be so frustrating to fight for for reasons like this um like you know when you're fighting an incarnation of something as dickish as conquest like mm. there's just dickishness going around um yeah <laughs> yeah um so uh blake is obviously kind of thinking about this uh reflection of the mortal world in the practitioner world which actually conveniently elliot it's kind of like our discussion question that's going on at this point. So, if you if you too want to theorize what the mortal world sees when practitioners go to war, check out our discussion question. We'll get to that a bit more later. <laughs> yeah, it, it's obviously. I think one thing we said last episode. Uh, so that was the episode six point eight, and we we said you know we do the week for the discussion question as we do, which would have put it on next Wednesday's episode uh 611 mm-hmm. but since since 6.8 was 2 days late and it's coming out the same day as this episode um yeah i think i think we should push that to 612 so yeah that makes sense so uh, we'll give you Friday. an extension on that discussion question i think yeah so so i think at the end of 612 um we'll, we'll yeah. hit up hit up all the answers uh for that one um so i want to pull out this quote just because i think this chapter is full of really nice quotes and this is one example that i quite liked where blake is is thinking about uh is thinking about conquest kind of subjugating the the entire city and thinks magic has a price but it's not always the practitioner that pays it i like this quote it's like a, it's <laughs> it's it's a kind of nice little abstract summation of of some of the stuff flying around at this point of the chapter yeah, my response to reading this line the first time was literally just like, nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think it ties into the theme of this whole opening section so well, like where, you know, this, this there's a recurring theme sort of throughout all these conversations in Blake's apartment that has to do with, um, you know, the collateral damage uh, to, to reference mm. the previous arc um, in, in this conquest contest uh, and... You know, Blake isn't the only one paying the price for trying to stay alive, I guess. <laughs> yes, no. Uh, the, it, it seems like there's a lot of collateral damage flying around. Um, yeah, and, and so that that whole kind of thought about collateral damage leads into this discussion about what it is to be a lord and uh, whether Blake should become a lord. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's interesting because it seems like Rose is almost being a bit of a, a Lady Macbeth here, kind of pushing him into, or, you know, not seriously doing it, obviously, but but kind of thinking, theorizing about what it would be like if Blake became a lord. But uh, he's he's just so against the idea um, that he just sees no value in it, which which makes sense, right? It, the, the main point is it's, it's a huge target on your back for not that much benefit. Yeah, you get a power gain, I guess, but I feel like you'd have to be 
power hungry or like you know someone like jeremy meath is for your god or whatever and and there's probably something for that but like in general for someone like blake who isn't really looking like who isn't power hungry like it's just like what why would i do this um yeah i mean maggie does raise the good point that if everyone's already trying to kill you, like, you may as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is a fair... I, I, I guess that's a fair point. <laughs> um, it does make me wonder why... Like, Jeremy Meath is a great example, because, you know, obviously now he's not power-hungry. But even in even in Sandra Duchamp's interlude, he didn't, he didn't seem to be that power-hungry, but obviously he was kind of making a play for the lordship, which is interesting. Yeah, I assume it's something to do with, like, service to his god or something. Because yeah. I agree, he didn't really strike me as the sort of person who'd want to be the lord for being the lord's sake. Um, yeah. But, yeah, like, I, I, this whole discussion was a bit interesting. Because ever since we heard, like, you know, the details on why Conquest was being sort of propped up by everyone. Like, you know, mm. I've just been thinking that that makes so much sense. Because we've just been talking about how shit, shit of a deal being the lord kind of is so having conquest as the figurehead was, was such a great idea and and uh, i think it was last episode maybe maybe the episode before where i was talking a bunch about whether it, like blake and his cabal were really the good guys a- mm. and i feel like this this helped me pin down exactly why i feel like maybe they're not as much and it's because there's actually no plan like on who would replace conquest like yeah historically replacing bad regimes in in like a bloody coup doesn't doesn't really install better regimes uh mm. So, yeah, like, it, it it's a glaring hole in, uh, I, I struggle to call what's going on here a plan, but it's a glaring hole in this plan that there's no replacement lined up for Conquest uh, by Blake and his yeah. group. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it really is a little worrying because, I mean, it, it just, you, you get the sense that, and they kind of, they talk about explicitly in this chapter how Things that happen to Conquest as the Lord are kind of reflected in what happens to the city, right? Mm, mm. And you can only imagine that, you know, not having a Lord or having a really unstable kind of Lordship that's hotly contested, it, it, it would lead to a kind of uh, degeneration of, of the state of the city to an extent, Oh, absolutely, right? yeah. Uh, yeah, they, they really don't, and it's not like they'll just figure it out when they get there. I can't think of a single person on their team that would be the Lord. Or any, really anybody in Toronto who would want to be the Lord. Maybe Isadora, but yeah. she probably wouldn't want to. I feel like that'd, that'd be her reluctantly stepping up uh, at yeah. best. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. And like they, they do go into this, and, and it's something I'd been wondering about, like whether the fact that Conquest was the Lord of Toronto had been having... Like like an effect on the energy or or like the the history of Toronto. I'm not that familiar with mm. the history of Toronto, but like I wonder if this was you know is this sort of a decision Walbo made? Like is there something in the history of Toronto that makes yeah. it seem appropriately conquesty or maybe it's a political statement by Walbo about people in Toronto being too quick to anger or something? I don't I don't yeah I don't have any context on that. I might try I might I might try and do more research on that. It's just something I've been wondering in this this conversation really really sort of put it to the fore fore in my head like mm. you know what was there was there more reason as to why conquest was chosen mm. as as the lord of toronto like because you know it's it's implied that other cities have very different lords so i i guess what kind of statement might walbo be trying to make about toronto maybe there's something to <laughs> figure out yeah um Anyway, moving on. Uh, so, so the next thing is, that happens, a, a large chunk of this chapter is, is the group kind of discussing and planning and, and figuring out what they want to do next. Um, or not so much figuring out what they want to do next, but figuring out what they can do in a general sense to win <laughs> here. Uh, so they, they start talking about Conquest's other allies and, and fellas kind of discussing the need to further fortify their location now. Yeah, I mean, well, he basically just gets a chance to hate on Blake's existing warding, which is very fell. <laughs> yep. uh, I really liked this little conversation about, like, heartlessness uh, mm. and stuff in this situation. Like, Blake, uh, sorry, Fell and Maggie talk a bit about how, you know, Blake is, is being not quite heartless enough at the moment, but they don't <laughs> want him to go too not, like, they don't want him to go too heartless because that means demons, so there's, like, this small window and they're saying you've got to be here where you don't care about the collateral but you care about it enough not to throw demons out like yeah that's pretty they, funny they, and and quite reasonable but yeah 
They want a uh, kind of anti-hero Blake, not like dark Blake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, there, there's a quote that was very interesting when I was reading it, where uh, Blake, Blake, they're talking about kind of being in his apartment, and Blake says, "I spent last night in a jail cell. I'm definitely going to try to sleep tonight." And reading that, I was just like, "Oh fuck! Last night was the jail cell." <laughs> It's so, every time something like this comes up, I'm still, I'm always caught off guard by just how fast of a timeline this story takes place over. Yeah, I had the same reaction. I I read this line and I was like, wait, shit, that was yesterday? Um, Yeah. And so I think I've run through the events, like, since since the start of Arc 5. And this would be, like, 2 or 3 a.m., like, the next night, right? Like, we're we're talking. Yeah. Because it was sort of midnight, I think, that all the... The challenge Everything stuff kind of went down. Photos yeah. went down. So I guess I hadn't realized it had only been like a couple of hours since since the contest started. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it would have been it would have been almost twenty four hours ago that he was sitting in a cell. Yeah, some I think it's somewhere between like four a.m. and like maybe six or seven a.m. Um, somewhere around that range. The chapter ends with him sleeping for a bit and then waking up to dawn. So. Oh it gosh, no! It can't, so it must it be, can't be that way. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's it's interesting. It's yeah. It's it's uh it's fast paced. I kind of <laughs> I think this probably is what helps to to give it a reputation as being a very uh kind of breakneck paced story. I yeah. It's it's very relentless. Like you know, I I can't wait. I I can't wait for Blake to have that moment to recharge or whatever. But I remember thinking the same thing in Worm. Uh, as doing that, mm. I was like, I can't wait till. You know, Taylor just has a week to fortify her territory or whatever, and well, I mean, <laughs> never really worked out. Um, mm. But I, I also so there's a bit where Blake is talking about you know how recharged he's gotten from riding on his bike and uh, you know having having his friends around, and he says, "Is there a flip side to that? Uh, have I been weakening myself by thrusting myself into unfamiliar situations?" Yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, because like having watched Blake in action for a couple of arcs now. I almost think it could be the other way around. Like, he's someone who, mm. uh, for want of a better term, thrives in the chaos. And, uh, like, maybe maybe he's someone who, you know, like, if you let him prepare and stuff, like, you know, he's someone who gets who gets comfort from doing things. And so I think actually throwing himself in these situations might be uh, his play. Yeah, I, I'm kind of thinking about whenever a question like this comes up, like, would I be more powerful in this situation or not? The the thing I always try to think about is well how how do the spirits react to this and I think I generally think that 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 the spirits kind of would get more out of Blake being improvisational and kind of bouncing around because that is his style it kind of kind of plays off of what he who he is and so I think it I think that makes sense that that his improvisational style kind of actually strengthens his ability to kind of flourish in unfamiliar situations. Yeah, well, I just think him being in a calm situation and just sort of resting that much doesn't really gel with my understanding of him, and that that may be skewed by you know the last two weeks of his life. But um, <laughs> like, I very much get the sense that he was never a very restful person. Uh, yeah. So yeah, like you, you know, he he is someone who needs to go out and be doing stuff, and, and I think that in a way, like that's his comfort zone is is yeah leaving his comfort zone. Um, <laughs> not, not quite as yeah. much as he has been, obviously, but, but a bit. Yeah, that, I think that makes sense to me. I think that, that seems like a valid, uh, a valid take. <laughs> um, so Blake is still quite suspicious of Maggie and kind of tries to, to pin down some of the things that she's saying, kind of asking her questions about what she's been up to, all, all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> he, 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 she really doesn't give him any solid answers. Yeah, uh, like, this conversation with Maggie kind of made me feel like he was trying to cut down a tree with a salmon. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, like, I was wondering if, if that's the goblin influence on her or, or like, whether she was just like that. Or I, I mean, as I'm asking, I'm now realizing it's both. Um, mm. that That's just her. But, like, she's she's just sort of unnecessarily difficult, I, I would think, uh, here. Like, she's, yeah. she's clearly trying to avoid telling him something. Yeah. I, yeah, I think so. I think... Maggie has this kind of natural uh, evasiveness or being naturally difficult is kind of Maggie's brand to an extent. Um, yeah, yeah. But it does seem that she's a bit more evasive than usual, right? Yeah, and she she 
basically says that uh, telling Blake exactly what she did would would not would not be good for him right now. Would be helpful, yeah. Which is like very concerning to hear. So I'd like to think it's something relatively benign. Like he just wouldn't approve of like maybe something she did to her dads to like mm. char- charm them or whatever. Like, but uh, yeah, like I don't know. It, it it's definitely concerning. Yeah, who knows? Um, so the cabal kind of gets back to talking about the players and different ways to to gain some possible ground. I suppose. Yeah. Well, because. Yeah. Blake is planning to still go to the police station this morning, uh, as, <laughs> yeah, he, that's... as he promised to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I kind of forgot go that wrong? he had to do that until this <laughs> came, came up. Um, but I'm glad Blake didn't forget, because he made a very clear promise to this police officer. Yeah. And so, Blake's kind of taking this attitude of, oh, well, I have to go back anyway. Might as well deal with Fell while I do it. Which is a fucking wild thing to think, because... They must know that he he's coming. Yeah, well, and that's basically what Fell says to him. He's like, they're going to know uh, yeah. you're, you're coming. And, and I mean, yeah, it doesn't, it, it kind of contradicts his whole, like, keep calm and, and avoid plan. Yeah, like he's, wait, he's a, wait it out plan, yeah. Um, You know, I, I, I do like the idea of trying to, you know, pocket off one or two of the champions and, and maybe take them out of the picture, but not kill them, apparently. But there's this this interesting little bit on like the rules of of karma and and how like in stealing stuff and yeah so basically Fel sort of thinks that the reason Blake may not have gotten bad karma from stealing the trinket from Duncan is because Duncan took June first but mm-hmm. I mean like confis- he confiscated it as like an arresting officer like mm. seems kind of legit to me like. I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just arguing with the spirits now, which is probably very pointless. But it, <laughs> it it would seem to me if the spirits are respecting the role of police officer in in someone like Laird to some degree, it seems weird that they be punishing some punishing a police officer for from taking an axe off a person they're putting in jail. Mm. For. Like that seems that seems like a given. I, I guess maybe the spirits are aware it was like essentially false pretenses. Yeah, I I don't know. I think if I was a spirit, I'd rule this one the kind of neutral. Like they were, they were locked into a a pretty good fight, and it was kind of an all's fair in love and war kind of deal. I think. Yeah, well, I, I thought Fell basically said that that doesn't really hold up, and because Blake was complaining mm. about how nitpicky the spirits are. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so one other thing I want to talk about is is Fell kind of dishes a bit of goss about the astrologer. Um, Talking about her powers, which are wild, she, uh, <laughs> she seems to, like, make pictures on the sky with, like, laser shows and somehow summon things through this, which is <laughs> very bizarre and it's awesome. Um, but it's also worth thinking about, Fel isn't sure why she's siding with Conquest anymore. I mean, she was obviously, apparently, Team Blake back back when this whole kicked off. Um, but yeah, now it does seem like she's... Not just kind of a, a champion of conquests, but is actively being a champion, not kind of passively resisting. I mean, well, that's certainly the impression Fell seems to be under, but also he hasn't really been in con- in contact with conquests. So mm. just tying my own tongue there, uh, like since the astrologer was chosen, so we don't actually know if she is really like working for him. Like, uh, you know, this is sort of followed up by uh, Fell kind of saying he's under no obligation to not just kill Blake and. So, you know, <laughs> it, it's very easy to believe that the astrologer may still be Team Blake and, and like, betray conquests. We don't know. Um, but, but that I mean, that's really the whole thing is we don't know. Like, we only heard secondhand that she was even on Blake's team. Like, um, I, I, I feel like the astrologer's maybe one of those characters who's going to come in with some 4D chess move play just because, like, astrology is, mm. you know, all about, like, I associate it with, like, predicting the future and stuff. And obviously, we've got, like, the augury yep. going on with the Bahames. But I feel like... I feel like the astrologer is someone who's like reading fates and stuff and is probably playing a bit of a long game uh, mm. relative to everyone else. Like in this situation, a long game is like 24 hours into the future. Um, <laughs> That's like an entire arc. That's pretty yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, she's definitely, if I was Blake, I'd be hoping that Laird's backup would be the astrologer because she seems like the one who's least inclined to just outright kill him. Uh, without giving him a chance to explain himself. Yes, yes, I think so. I, I still, you know, uh, Fell definitely 
gets a strong vibe that there's something else going on there, right? Yeah. So I wouldn't trust them too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, she's been set up to be very like mysterious. Like we've we've sort of known so little yeah. about her, and then especially this chapter, we're now finding out that nobody really understands how she does what she does. Like her mm-hmm. astrology is so far beyond everyone else's understanding of what astrology is. They don't even really know what she can do. They know that she has like lasers and shit, and that's pretty much it. They're like she does lasers, and then stuff appears. Um, yeah, basically seems to be like Conquest's understanding of her power, which is <laughs> uh, like pretty crazy. So yeah, yeah, like she's she's been set up as a big mystery thing, which is why I think she's going to be someone who comes in with with uh, big unexpected power moves later. All right, well we'll see, I suppose. Um, yeah. So anyway, the next thing that happens is Fell threatens to kill Blake, which is fun. Yeah, and I mean, like it it did make sense. The thought had crossed my mind and. Like, Blake, yep. Blake handles it about as pro- appropriately as I think you should, which is like, yeah, fair call. Like, if it comes down to it, let's let's do that to yeah. fuck up Conquest. I think he kind of acknowledges that it's, at a certain point, it'll be the best plan, right? Yeah. I mean... <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, he's probably thankful to Fel. I mean, like, as Fel sort of brings up, there's nothing to stop Fel going with this plan right now. Uh, mm. So there's a sort of trust sa- slash respect from Fel... That he's not just doing that. Like, yeah. It seems like the obvious thing for Fel to do would be to just do it right now. So there's there's something to be said for Fel not doing it right now. I think I think that also. I mean, not to undercut that Fel probably is starting to get on Team Blake a bit more. But um, if he does kill Blake, he's just back into Conquest service. I mean, he he still wants Blake to win here. Um. Yeah, I'd have to go and look at the exact terms now. But like, if Fel if Fel kills him, I, I don't know exactly what that means for where Conquest is sitting. Um, mm. Although a, a lot of people would be conspiring to make sure Conquest gets to stay where he is, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, I think it wouldn't... Like, it would obviously be a drawback to Conquest. He wouldn't get access to Blake's shit, uh, mm. probably. But, um, I, you know, it wouldn't unseat him. And so Fel and presumably Rose would, would kind of be trapped in the same positions they already are in. Yeah, I guess it would just be another one of Fell's little fuck yous to conquest type thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I like this concept of Blake, after saying it's okay that Fell wants to kill him, he also specifies that you need to make sure, like, my soul stays out of his grasp, which, with the shepherd in play, is a sensible clarification, but it's pretty fucking, like, grim. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty rough. Uh, yeah, uh, keeping his soul... <laughs> what does that even entail? Like. Yeah, I mean, wait, that's sort of what they said Evan was. He was a soul, right? Oh, that's what Rose yeah. seemed to think he was. Yeah. So, eventually, this Blake, like, agrees to this and uh, and then is so pooped by all this discussion that he goes to he goes to bed and we, we cut to Blake having a pretty bad nightmare, kind of being mm-hmm. haunted by visions of, of past demons. Yeah, literally and metaphorically. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. The the thing I I like about this is I'm very torn about how much to just read it as like a normal nightmare and how much I need to start tinfoiling about what other forces might be involved. Um, mm. Like I could see it going either way. Like it, it's a great, even if it's just a nightmare, that's great. And, and I, I'm always a fan of when uh, supernatural books like this have things that are just like, benign human shit. Like, it would be very normal for Blake to just have nightmares here. There's no need for it to be uh, something, like, magic, but then also there could be cool magical explanations for it. So uh, mm. I just I just enjoyed arguing with myself about whether or not to tinfoil uh, this this nightmare. My my kind of... The place I landed on it... So, actually, let's talk about the nightmare a bit first. So, so basically, in a... Uh, the the best way for me to summarize that I think is Blake is kind of haunted by the trials that he's completed or by mm-hmm. any real interactions that he's had with magic. So uh, yeah. the locket makes an appearance kind of uh, binding him. Um, uh, the erasure demon is around kind of getting inside his eyes, which obviously mm. <laughs> is probably a bit of a, a trigger based on what happened when he, when they faced up. Um, Pose is there, the hyena's there. Uh, Rose is there with her kind of army of summons, um, and yeah. I, to me, it, to me, it, you, you can kind of read it as Blake just being kind of scarred by all the interactions with terrible things that he's had, which I think is 
totally valid. But I kind of, I kind of landed on it being a bit of a like a seeping of of bad energies into his brain through all of his interaction with these things. I think like not an active kind of you know attack or anything, but hmm. but a, a result of Blake's close proximity to so many bad things. Yeah, I, and I mean, yeah, you're right. It's just sort of like every every sort of big supernatural confrontation he's had sort of makes some kind of appearance. Like he even can't mm. breathe in the dream, which was that you know the heart attack attack. Uh, yeah, c- c- a couple of chapters ago. Yeah, and all the rose stuff is is pretty ominous. Uh, <laughs> like, yes, it kind of indicates that stuff isn't so good right now between them. I mean, in case we needed this dream to to reaffirm that. Mm. But um, like I, I remember seeing somewhere, and and I, I've sort of agreed with this since I saw it. Um, reading someone saying that they think dreams or, or nightmares work really well in fiction when they're sort of revealing to us subconscious concerns that the characters are going through that the characters don't necessarily mm. realize they they're going mm. through. And, and I think that's why I'm I'm more than happy to read this nightmare as as something that is just natural because. Like, this is Blake's subconscious really dealing with, like, all the hor- horrific shit he's been through. Yeah. Um, and then also, I, I think the, the big thing is is the role Rose plays in this nightmare. Like, she, like, you know, what what sort of ends up being revealed to us is that, like, the all, his, his, abil- his inability to interact with anything in the dream, like, he couldn't open doors or anything, was essentially a metaphor for being in Rose's position. And then you see Rose yep. standing there with all this powerful shit that she summons. So, there's very much um anti rose uh sentiment spread throughout this uh oh, yeah. this nightmare and 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 I think that's that's really my big takeaway from from sort of reading this was thinking oh like Blake Blake is really harboring some some insecurities about uh Rose's intentions both towards him and the world uh yeah. and that's that's not a good thing yeah um and he kind of realizes this when he wakes yeah. up and kind of reflects yeah. on it a bit uh, I'm going to pull out this quote here where he thinks I was the doer of our pair, the warrior even, by necessity more than because I was suited to it. Rose was the thinker, the scholar with access to the books. Midge, Midge would have maybe been, uh, Midge would maybe have been Rose's warrior in my place, making her less reliant on me, supplanting me. So apart from a nice little reference to the kind of war- <laughs> warrior scholar pair dynamic, which yeah, it is stood fun, out to me as well. That's, yeah, that's a fun, fun little, little reference. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is kind of revealing what we talked about. Was it last chapter or the chapter before? Blake's kind of worry about Midge um, and and what sh- what Midge meant to Rose. And I don't know. <laughs> so in short, Blake is kind of like, oh, Rose is trying to replace me with Midge, right? Hmm. Which doesn't feel like a super accurate read to me. Well, so that that's interesting. I thought the opposite. I was like, isn't that explicitly what she's trying to do? Like, I thought that was explicitly like openly her goal was like you're not really my hands i need to summon something to be my hands yes i i i get what you mean and yes you know rose is an, i i think the difference here is the the replacement aspect of it right like rose is is trying to get midge so that she has a some physical presence right mm. um but <laughs> to me blake fearing that you know rose is going to rose rose just wants to have Midge so that she can distance herself from Blake feels like a, a an extreme read on that. It doesn't, it, I don't know, it doesn't sit right to me. It is definitely a very negative take on what she's trying to do. Like, like the, yeah. the reasons she's been giving where she just wants hands and the ability to act on the world without having to go through Blake, who never listens to her, like, <laughs> it seems, it seems like enough to me, and right. Whereas, like Blake yeah, is for sure. Blake is seems to be taking it very personally. Um, he 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 thinks there has to be some kind of grander purpose behind it, which I don't know if that's right. Uh, yeah, and especially like if Rose does just replace him and and has the ability to enact her her own will on the world, like through these other beings. Doesn't that mm. mean Blake could just fuck off somewhere and not have to deal with this shit anymore? Like replacing mm. him is that really a bad thing like she, she can supplant him and then he could just well like he could just I think avoid he still this. wants to <laughs> i think he still wants to have his friends and stuff like he he has a life that he's built for himself take him with um, him <laughs> um so 
Uh, well, so yeah, I guess we're jumping ahead a bit, but I think I want to bring this up now because I think it's relevant. Um, later on, Blake finds out that Rose, if he dies, Rose is going to become the next Thorburn heir, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, interestingly, this f- thought about Rose getting Midge to replace Blake and the, and finding out later that, that Rose could actually replace Blake if he dies. I think it kind of proves to me that if this is true, it means Rose didn't know about it, right? Because if if Rose is actually trying to replace Blake now, th- clearly this is not the right way to go about it if she knows that she can actually replace Blake if he dies. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, I mean, there could be a lot of reasons, like karmical ones for starters, that are why she, she has to play it a certain way. Um mm. Wait, wait, we do see, and I'm I'm jumping ahead a bit too, but is, when Isadora shows up, uh, part of her reason for doing so is that she wants to let him know that she's going to attack him, and, and we've seen, yeah. like, Leia do that because it's good karma. So, yeah. wait, Rose may have sort of figured she doesn't want to sneak attack him for karmic reasons, and she can't yeah, just, like, tell him. Uh, like, she- if Rose does know about this, this probably wasn't information she wanted Blake to have, because he was already- like we've we've just seen he he was already a bit paranoid about her and her motivations. Yeah, that's that's going to absolutely skyrocket now that this has been revealed <laughs> to him. Uh, yeah, it can only go bad, can't it? Um, let's let's we'll we'll get we'll get back to it in a moment, I suppose. Um, so yeah. Blake wakes up from his nightmare, and Evan and Rose are there because Evan kind of knew that that he was having a nightmare and called Rose over. Uh, mm. and, and Evan kind of gives him a hug, which is very adorable. <laughs> um, and this kind of cheers him up enough for him to get up and, and kind of talk to Rose about potential sabotage, not by her, which is interesting because <laughs> it's clearly on his mind, but by Maggie. Yeah. Uh, and so for starters, like a ghost hug by Evan, like it's so perfect for Blake. <laughs> like it's a hug, but there's no touching. Like Evan was such a great pick for Blake as, as a familiar. I love it. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's great. He's awesome. Um uh so Rose Rose's read on Maggie is that she hasn't really noticed anything off, right? Um which doesn't reassure Blake, but I don't know. Kind of is, is a step towards oh this is just kind of natural Maggie being some something has happened sure, but it's just kind of natural Maggie, not not anything too freaky. Yeah. Yeah, essentially. Um I mean, we did have that weird beat, I think it was last chapter, where Rose was looking at Maggie more than, like, focusing on the conversation, and there was, like, the implication that <laughs> yeah. maybe maybe there was something there, but uh doesn't seem like it right now. Yeah. Um, also, so, Evan and Rose don't sleep. Maggie didn't sleep last night, too busy thinking. Um, does anybody in this house sleep? <laughs> Is it just yeah. Blake who sleeps? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Blake and his horrific nightmares that, like, absolutely destroyed him like physically and mentally is actually the winner in this apartment when it comes to sleeping and i wonder if he feels well rested there's an implication that that he does feel a lot better than he did and and rose talks about how the flow of energy is better so i think i think there's an implication that sleeping in his own bed uh did a lot for him even though it was kind of only like a one or two hour sleep and it was interrupted by some pretty horrible nightmares yeah still power of sleep i guess yeah I also love this little bit where Blake and Rose are saying there are bad things that make you stronger and there are bad things that make you weaker. And then Evan just mm. sort of has to chime in and it's like, hey, there are also good things. Like good things can make you weaker and good things can make you stronger. But <laughs> just like, yeah. just there are good things. And, and, Blake, and, Rose are, yeah. Yeah. Blake and Rose are both sort of like, oh, yeah, yeah, good point. Like, uh, I thought that was a really great little character moment that encapsulates all three of them pretty well. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, there's there's a bunch of little bits in this section that are just like peak Evan. Like, how he woke up Maggie to watch TV. Like, that's such an eight-year-old move. Uh, <laughs> like, everyone's going through some dire shit, and it's just like, hey, hey, I want to watch TV. <laughs> and the kind of TV that's on from 4 to 6 a.m. in the morning is <laughs> not, not the good. kind of TV that's going to be very fun, ever. i got to tell you, but, yeah, you know, he'll figure that out. Um, yeah. Evan is adorable. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like we talk about this a lot, but um, I think everybody who reads Pact gets to Evan and they're like, man, he's just, <laughs> he's just so great. He really is such a breath of positivity into the story, which I think is is uh, needed. Um, yeah, he's a ray of sunshine, uh, for particularly yeah. like, you know, it's, it's pretty dark and morbid stuff we're dealing with in this section uh, where 
you know, Blake's basically worried that everyone close to him is betraying him. Uh, yeah. And so then Evan's just walking around being a bit, like, goofy and innocent. It's <laughs> it, it really balances yeah. things out. You can't, it's impossible to suspect Evan of betrayal. It's just too, <laughs> he's just too great. Yeah. Um. So the next thing that happens is Isadora threatens to kill Blake, which is also fun. Um. A lot of people are threatening to kill Blake this chapter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, well, I mean, this story. Um, yes, yeah, true. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, I Blake. mean, thank God for this whole thing where it's good karma to tell someone you're going to attack them, or, like, Blake would just oh, be yeah. getting sneak attacked all the time. Yeah, I guess. I guess that's true. It, it kind of, without that, Blake would, would really not be aware of these attacks coming in. I mean, you know, until Isadora came and says to Blake hey, I'm going to kill you. She definitely wasn't in my mind as something to be watching out for, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I loved how chill this whole conversation with Isadora is, where she's like, just so you know, like, I'm going to attack you. And he's like, can you, can't you put it off? She's like, Mm. no. And he's like, okay. Like, there's just something so, so defeatist, but also just chill about it. I, I, I found it really captivating. So why can't she put it off? I think- my my thought on that is it's probably something similar to what Fell's thinking, right? Where it's just like, fuck it, I'm just going to kill him and get this over with. <laughs> yeah, oh, that that's very much my my guess as to what, what her motivations are. If she can get in and take care of him before conquest, this whole thing can be over. Yeah, but before she goes, Isadora also tell, tells Blake uh, what we already know since Fell's interlude. If he dies, Rose takes over. Which, Mm -hmm. now that he knows this, I mean, we kind of hinted at it before, but it can only lead to some really paranoid outcomes. Yeah, and so in fact, I want to pull out, like, how Isadora opens up this revelation. So she says, uh, I'm here for two reasons. One hostile that may inadvertently help, and one helpful Mm. reason that may lead to disaster for you. Which is like, Mm. of course, it's a fucking riddle as to why she's there, because it's Isadora. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, I I like this idea that, you know, she's there- for hostility, but she thinks it'll help because obviously taking Blake out of the picture, that's pretty yeah. helpful. Um, but then also she, she just wants to help him out. Uh, but it, yeah, there's no way this doesn't lead to disaster. Like he, we, we've just been going on. He was already harboring uh, some paranoia about Rose and there's no way that doesn't ratchet up to 10 uh, now. Oh yeah. Well, uh, I think the one, the one thought counter to that is, I don't think there is any way that Rose would want to be more actively involved than she already is. I mean, like, well, that's the, that's the one safe harbour to me is I don't think Rose would choose to be in Blake's position. I mean, definitely not right now. Um, like, yeah. I, I think she can make a pretty solid case for I promise I'm not going to try anything until afterward uh, this whole conquest fuckery. <laughs> Um, <laughs> even that would be so wild, like her being like, <laughs> yeah, I won't, I won't do any outward negative moves against you for now. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think the big thing, like surely the first thing Blake is going to do is go and find Rose and be like, did you know? Uh, oh yeah. We'll and see. I, I have a feeling the answer is probably yes. I think, I think I sort of said something along those lines quite a while ago in the story, um, that she, that mm. she knew something like this. So I, I'm still leaning towards yes, she did, which which will not be good for the relationship, which is also why I think it'll be yes, because that's worse. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, like, because that gets me thinking, like, was Rose really pissed off about this whole conquest situation because she's trying to find the right time to try and replace <laughs> Blake? Like, I, I, I don't want to well, make her sound so evil, like she wanted to kill him, but maybe she was trying to find a more passive way, but it's kind of like she's trying to find a convenient time to you know, as you said, there's more danger to her in the physical world. And so it's like she's trying to find the right time to step in where she's not going to be under threat. And it must be pretty mm. frustrating for her that Blake keeps throwing himself into situations where it's going to be bad for her if she's plopped into the real world. You know what makes me think she didn't know? Or that she's, you know, that that there's, if she did know that there's not some kind of Machiavellian plan here, is she put on the chain, right? She- Mm. She chose to put on the chain from Conquest. And if she yeah. knew that she was going to possibly become the the practitioner, obviously that was a move that could only make her situation worse. And in fact, kind of took away an avenue of escape for her. Like if Blake was the one wearing the chain and he died, 
she would presumably just be kind of <laughs> just fuck able off. to skip on out of there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Get the hell out so, of Dodge. Uh, yeah, that that's the bit that to me makes me think there's nothing too Machiavellian going on here, even if she did know. Yeah, yeah, I I would agree. Um, I I don't think I don't think she's had evil plans all this time to to let Blake die or whatever. I I think she has genuinely done her best. But it, like, you know, she keeps getting annoyed that he throws himself into dangerous situations, and I think now we know maybe part of the motivation for that was if she knew. She's getting frustrated that yeah. Blake keeps putting himself in situations where when she gets, if she gets popped into the physical world when he dies, she's going to be in dire situations. Like she, wa- <laughs> she wants Blake to take care of himself so that she's not in danger when he dies. Well, I mean, I think that's possible. But also just her previous assumption was that if he dies, she dies, right? I mean, I supposedly. Think, I think that's enough of a, of a reason to get annoyed at, <laughs> annoyed at him. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's true. That's true. Um, so, uh, that's, that's the end of our discussion for 6.9. I guess we have to see, I'm excited to see how, how that reaction and confrontation goes down next chapter. Um, oh, like presumably just says, bye Isadora, see you later today, hopefully. And then <laughs> goes and chats to Rose about it. Um, yeah, there's so many plates spinning at the moment to, <laughs> to borrow Isadora's, uh, reference, but, yeah. uh, yeah. Anyways, as you said, that's, that's the end of our chapter and, uh, <clears throat> Just a reminder, uh, as we mentioned at the start of the episode, we have a discussion question on, so that will be that, that we'll be reading out answers for that uh, when we're recording six point twelve in a week from now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that discussion question is: uh, which weird historical events are likely to be rationalised practitioning? Yes, I'm. I'm really excited to see some answers to this one. Just because. Yeah, I, I think there's such a wide space to play in with this question. I'm really keen to find out some weird fucking history and some fan <laughs> theories behind it. Um, yeah. But uh, before we leave uh, for this episode, we want to dive into some comments from when this chapter came out five years ago and mm-hmm. see what people are, are thinking about this. Um, I always like doing these when we've just had a nice little reveal so people can kind of put their tinfoil hats on and see what's going <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah, uh, I enjoy seeing other people doing same dumb kind of tinfoiling that I am. Um, so, I, I picked out a comment by Sun Tzu Anime. Uh, oh, my God. What a great name, <laughs> first off. <laughs> it's pretty good, yeah. Um, and, and so, they've just pointed out that Rose is the third heir. And, and obviously, we love our, our rule of three uh, in, mm. in Pact. I think the, the thing that really made me pull this out is there's another user called Some Guy. And... They they point out Blake won in round two against Duncan, so like you know, hopefully hopefully that's maybe a bit of a pattern for Blake is is propping up the round two bit because that's him. Uh, he, well, yeah, as the second heir. Yeah, so Blake's obviously the round two round two against Duncan. Uh, this is presumably the round two of Maggie's uh, Maggie's b- blood and fire. Uh, parades i guess um (laughs) so there might be a theme building of of blake not playing by the rule of threes rule and kind of getting in beforehand with the with the quick round two victory (laughs) yeah well i mean you know if if we're looking at the whole rose as the third air then i mean we better hope so otherwise he's pretty (laughs) stuff yeah i suppose um i i put out a comment by some guy uh, some some guy called some guy (laughs) <laughs> uh, and they kind of were worth talking about a, a way to obey fate. Uh, so, so I, I don't think we touched on this super hard, but Isidore mentions um, that Blake is fated to die and Rose is fated to replace him. As in, this isn't something that could happen if you die, Blake. This is something that will happen when you die. Yeah. Um, and so some guy's trying to think about how can we play along with this uh, obey the letter of this, but not the spirit of it, uh, and kind of theory crafts that that Blake can be kind of uh, choked by fell to death by asphyxiation, be kind of clinically dead, and then maybe they'll pass on the the status to to Rose, and then kind of be resuscitated back as Blake Thorburn, who's just kind of his own dude. Um, <laughs> which I, I always like thinking about ideas like this, and I can see it possibly working, but I don't know. I I don't. I think these kinds of tricks are the things that the the spirit system uh, kind of rule out. Yeah, you you haven't you haven't watched Buffy, have you? Uh, Ruben? uh some of it, not uh, okay. all of it. it. This this basically happens in Buffy. Like Buffy's the 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 slayer, the, the chosen one, and and she dies briefly in one one bit, and then comes back, and another person gets chosen, 
and then there's sort of conflict because there's two at once. So, <laughs> I mean, this person's sort of predicting exactly what happened in Buffy uh, mm. sort of deal. Um, yeah, I, I agree, though. I, I feel like the spirits... The spirits are cleverer than this. Um, or, you know, yeah. They're, they're not, they're not going to let you get out of it that easily. Yeah, the spirits aren't super clever, but I think they'll catch... They catch some tricks, and I think this is one of the tricks that they would catch. Yeah, it seems like... It seems like they're very... The thing about the spirits is there's no hard rules here. Like, they're, they're very interpretive. Like, we've seen... I, I guess when I first heard about being forsworn and stuff, I was seeing it as this very black and white, like, light switch rule. Uh, yep. on and off and we've already seen with things like Duncan that karma is a bit more interpretive and, and cont- context aware than that and yeah I and mean, that's what makes me think something like this wouldn't work is context actually does matter and the spirits are going to be like nah we can see what you're fucking doing mate no dice yeah uh, yeah I think I think people are looking for ways for Blake to escape his fate but from what we know about this world Blake's fate is his fate, right? Uh, like, yeah, well, I, I actually don't know. Like, <laughs> I, I could see that going either way. I, I, I don't even want to speculate on cosmic forces like that at this point mm. in the story. But, uh, I, I mean, yeah, well, I think there might be a way to rewrite that fate or somehow meet it and like get around it somehow. I don't know, but mm. this doesn't feel like it to me. Mm. Well, I guess that's the end of our discussion for today. We'll see how Blake escapes his fate next time on <laughs> Pact 610, I suppose. Um, if you have an answer to the discussion question or any other thoughts on this chapter, make sure you leave them in our discussion thread, which will be linked in the episode description down below. Yeah. And, and you know, running a podcast c- can be hard and, and you've got to host a website and sometimes those websites mm. require money to be hosted or they don't work. Uh, and- <laughs> sometimes most of the time i would say <laughs> um and and the doof media website uh doofmedia.com is entirely dependent on patreons to keep it afloat and to keep all the great podcasts on it afloat uh yep. so if you head to patreon.com slash doof media um and you know donate us any money you can spare that'll help uh keep everything keep keep the lights on over here at doof hq Yes, there are a bunch of, of great shows on the Doof Media Network, and they exist because of patrons. Um, so check out doofmedia.com, check out all the great shows, and head on to the Patreon to, to, to back them, I suppose. Um, and while you're on Patreon, hey, why not, why not head over to patreon.com slash wildbo and uh, give some money to wildbo for writing all these great stories? Um, I heard a rumor that if we donate enough money to him, he might write Pact 2, so get on it, folks. That I just made that up, but... You know, who knows? We'll keep spreading that rumor till it becomes true. Is is that the (laughs) point? Yeah. And so I think apart from that, we'll see everyone on Monday, the 20th of May for 610. See you then. (laughs) 